What Irish man, woman, or child has not heard of our renowned Hiberian Hercules, the great and glorious Finn McCool? Not one from Cape Clear to the Giant's Causeway, nor from that back again to Cape Clear. And by the way, speaking of the Giant's Causeway brings me at once to the beginning of my story. Well, it so happened that Finn and his men were all working at the causeway in order to make a bridge across to Scotland, when Finn, who was very fond of his wife Una, took it into his head that he would go home and see how the poor woman got on in his absence. So, accordingly, he pulled up a fir tree, and after lopping off the roots and branches, made a walking stick of it, and set out on his way to Una. Una, or rather Finn, lived at this time on the very tip-top of Knockmanny Hill, which faces a cousin of its own called Cullamore, that rises up half hill, half mountain, on the opposite side. There was at that time another giant, named Cullin. Some say he was Irish, and some say he was Scotch. But whether Scotch or Irish, sorrow doubt of it, but he was a Tager. No other giant of the day could stand before him, and such was his strength that, when well vexed, he could give a stamp that shook the country about him. The fame and name of him went far and near, and nothing in the shape of man, it was said, had any chance with him in a fight. By one blow of his fist he flattened a thunderbolt and kept it in his pocket, in the shape of a pancake, to show all of his enemies when they were about to fight him. Undoubtedly he had given every giant in Ireland a considerable beating, barring Finn McCool himself. He swore that he would never rest night or day, winter or summer, until he would serve Finn with the same sauce, if he could catch him. However, the short and long of it was, with reverence, reverence be it spoken, that Finn heard Cull Cullen was coming to the causeway to have a trial of strength for him, and he was seized with a very warm and sudden fit of affection for his wife, poor woman leading a very lonely, uncomfortable life of it in his absence. He accordingly pulled up the fir tree, as I said before, having snedded it into a walking stick, he set out on his travel to see his darling Una on the top of Knockmanny, by the way. In truth, the people wondered very much why it was that Finn selected such a windy spot for his dwelling house, and they even went so far to tell him as much. What can you mean, Mr. McCool, said they, by pitching your tent on the top of Knockmanny, where you're never without a breeze, day or night, winter or summer, and where you're often forced to take your nightcap without either going to bed or turning up your little finger, eh, Anne? Where, besides this, there is sorrow of Owen's want of water. Why, said Finn, ever since I was at the height of a rounded tower, I was known to be fond of having a good prospect of my own. And where the Dickens, neighbours, could I find a better spot for good prospect than at the top of Knock Manny? As for water, I am sinking a pump, and plays goodness as soon as the causeway is made, I intend to finish it. Now, this was more of Finn's philosophy, for the real state of case was that he pitched upon the top of Knock Manny, in order so we might be able to see Cull Cullen coming towards his house. All we have to say is, if he wanted a spot from which to keep a sharp lookout, and, between ourselves, he did want it grievously, barring Sleeve Karub or Sleeve Donard, or his own cousin, Cullamore, he could not find a neater or more convenient situation for it than the sweet and saggiest province of Ulster. God save all here, said Fenn, good-humouredly upon putting his honest face into his own door. Musha Finn, have a can. You're welcome home to your own Una, you darling bully. Here followed a smack that is said to have made the waters of the lake of the bottom of the hill curl, as if it were, with kindness and sympathy. Finn spent two or three happy days with Una, and he felt himself very comfortable, considering the dread he had of Cole Cullen. This, however, grew upon him so much that his wife could not but perceive something lay on his mind which he kept all together to himself. Let a woman alone, in the meantime, for ferreting or wheedling a secret out of her good man, when she wishes. Finn was proof of this. It's this Col Cullen, he said, that's troubling me. When the fellow gets angry and begins to stamp, he'll shake your whole townland. It is well known that he can stomp a thunderbolt, for he always carries one around with him in the shape of a pancake, to show anyone that might misdoubt it. As he spoke, he clamped his thumb in his mouth, which he always did when he wanted to prophesy, or know anything that had happened in his absence. Then his wife asked him what he did it for. He's coming, said Finn. I see him below Dungannon. Thank goodness, dear. And who is it? Have it. Glory be God. That base called Cullen, replied Finn. And how I manage, I don't know. If I run away, I'm disgraced. 
and I know sooner or later I must meet him, for my thumb tells me so. When will he be here? said she. Tomorrow, about two o'clock, replied Finn with a groan. Well, my bully, don't be cast down, said Una. Depend on me, and maybe I'll bring you better out of the scrape than you ever could bring yourself. For rule of thumb. She then made a high smoke on top of the hill, after which she put her finger in her mouth and gave three whistles, and by that Colin knew he was invited to Cullamore, for this was the way that the Irish long ago gave a sign to all strangers and travellers, to let them know they were welcome to come take a share of whatever was going. In the meantime, Finn was very melancholy, and he did not know what to do, or how to act at all. Colin was an ugly customer to meet with, and the idea of the cake aforesaid flattened to the very heart of him. What chance could he have, strong and brave though he was, with a man who could, when put in passion, walk the country into earthquakes and knock thunderbolts into pancakes? Finn knew not what hand to turn to him, right or left backwards or forwards, or where he could go for him, no guess whatsoever. Una, said he, can you do nothing for me? Where's all your invention? Am I to be skewered like a rabbit before your eyes? To have my name disgraced forever in the sight of all my tribe? And me, the best man among them. How am I to fight this man mountain, this huge cross between earthquake and, and a thunderbolt? With a pancake in his pocket that was once, be easy thin. Look what I do now. Trot, I am ashamed of you. Keep your toe in a pump, will you? Talking of pancakes, maybe we'll give him as good as any he brings with him. Thunderbolt or otherwise. If I don't treat him to a smart feeding as he's got many a day, never trust Una again. Leave him to me. Now I do just as I bid you. This relieved Finn very much, for, after all, he had great confidence in his wife, knowing, as she did, that she had got him out of many quandary before. Una then drew the nine woollen threads of different colours, which she always did to find the best way of succeeding in anything of importance she went about. She then plaited them into three plaits with three colours in each, putting one on her right arm, one round her heart, and the third round her right ankle, for she knew then nothing could fail from what she undertook. Having everything now prepared, she sent round to the neighbours and borrowed one and twenty iron griddles, from which she took and kneaded into the hearts of one and twenty cakes of bread. And these she baked in the fire in the usual way, setting them aside in the cupboard according and as they were done. She then put down a large pot of new milk, which she made into curds and whey. Having done all of this, she sat down quite contented waiting for his arrival on the next day about two o'clock, that being the hour at which she was expected for Finn knew as much by the sucking of his thumb. Now this was a curious property that Finn's thumb had. In this very thing, moreover, he was very much resembled by his great foe, Cucullin, for it is well known that the huge strength he possessed all lay in the middle finger of his right hand, and that, if he happened by any mischance to lose it, he was no more for all of his bulk than a common man. At length, the next day, Colin was seen coming across the valley, and Una knew that it was time to commence operations. She immediately brought the cradle and made Finn to lie down on it, and cover himself with the clothes. You must pass for your own child, said she, to just lie there, snug, and say nothing, but be guided by me. About two o'clock, as had been expected, Colin came in. God save all here, said he. Is this where the great Finn McCool lives? Indeed it is, honest man, replied Una. God save you kindly, won't you be sitting? Thank you, ma'am, says he, sitting down. You are Mrs. McCool, I suppose. I am, says she. I have no reason, I hope, to be ashamed of my husband. No, said the other, and he has the name of being the strongest and bravest man in Ireland. But for all that, there's a man not far from you who is very desirous of taking shape with him. Is he at home? Why? Then no, she replied. If ever a man left this house in a fury, he did. It appears that someone told him a big bat-doon of a giant called Colin being down at the causeway to look for him, so he set out there to try if he could to catch him. Trot, I hope, for the poor giant's sake, he won't meet with him, for if he does, Finn will make paste out of him at once. Well, said the other, I am Colin, and I have been seeking him these twelve months, but he has always kept clear of me, and I will never rest night or day until I lay hands on him. At this, Una set up a loud laugh of great contempt, by the way, and looked at him as if he was only a mere handful of a man. Did you ever see Finn? said she, changing her manner all at once. How could I? said he. He always took great care to keep his distance. I thought so, she replied. I judge as much, and if you ever take my advice, you poor-looking creature, you'll pray night and day that you may never see him, for I tell you it will be a black day for you when you do. 
But in the meantime, you perceive that the wind's on the door, and if Finn himself is from home, you may be civil enough to turn the house, for it's always what Finn does when he's here. This was a startler, even to Cluck Colin, but he got up, however, and after pulling his middle finger of his right hand till he cracked three times, he went outside, and getting his arms about the house, turned it as if she had wished. When Finn saw this, he felt the sweat of fear oozing out through every pore of his skin. But Una, depending on her woman's wit, felt not a whit daunted. Ah, then, she said. You are so civil, that maybe you'll do another obliging turn for us, as Finn's not here to do it for himself. You see, after this long stretch of dry weather we've had, we feel very badly off for the want of water. Now, Finn says there's a fine spring well somewhere under these rocks down the hill there below. It is his intention to pull them asunder. But having heard of you, he left his place in such a fury, he never thought of it. Now, if you try to find it, drop, I'd feel a kindness. She then brought Cool Cullen to see the place, which was all one solid rock, and after looking at it for some time, he cracked his right middle finger nine times, and stooping down, tore a cleft about 400 feet deep, and a quarter of a mile in length, which has since been christened by the name of Lumford's Glen. You'll come in, now, she said and eat a bit of such humble fare that we can give you. Finn, even though you and he are enemies, would scorn not to be treated kindly in his own house. And, indeed, if I didn't do it, even in his absence, he would not be pleased with me. She accordingly brought him in and placed half a dozen of the cakes we spoke of before him. Together with a can or two of butter, a side of boiled bacon, a stack of cabbage, she decided to help himself for this, if be known it was long before the invention of potatoes. Poor Colin put one of the cakes in his mouth to take a huge whack of it, he made a thundering noise somewhere between a growl and a yell. Blood and fury, he shouted. How is this? Here are two of my front teeth out. What kind of bread is this you have given me? What's the matter? said Una cool, coolly. Matter I, shouted the other again. Why, here are two of my best teeth in my head gone. Why, said she, that's Finn's bread. It's the only bread he ever eats when he's at home. But, indeed, I forgot to tell you that nobody can eat it but himself. And the child in the cradle there. I thought, however, since you were reported to be a rather stout little fellow of your size, you might be able to manage it, and I did not wish to affront such a man who thinks himself able to fight Finn. Here's another cake. Maybe it's not so hard as that. Poor Colin at the moment was not only hungry, but ravenous, so he accordingly made a fresh set at the second cake, and immediately another yell, twice as loud as the first. Thunder and gibbets, he roared. Take this bread out of this. I will not have a tooth left in my head. There's another pair of them gone. Well... Honest man, replied Una, if you're not able to eat the bread, say so quietly, and don't be waking the child in the cradle there. There now, he's awake upon me. Finn now gave a skirl that startled the giant coming from such a youngster as he was supposed to be. Mother, he said, I be hungry, get me something to eat. Una went over, and putting into his hand a cake that had no griddle in it, Finn, whose appetite in the meantime had been sharpened by seeing eating going forward, soon swallowed it. Colin was thunderstruck and secretly thanked the stars he had the good fortune of missing to meet Finn, for, as he said to himself, I'd have no chance with a man who could eat bread such as that, which even the son but that's in his cradle can munch before my very eyes. I'd like to take a grin, said the lad in the cradle, he said to Una, for I can tell you that the infant who can manage the nutriment is no joke to look at or to feed off a scarce summer. With all the veins in my heart, replied Una, Get up, Ashkula, and show this decent little man something that wouldn't be unworthy of your father, Finn McCool. Finn, who was dressed for the occasion, much like a boy as possible, got up and bringing Cool Cullen out. Are you strong? said he. Thunder and hounds, explained the other. What a voice in such a small chap. Are you strong? said Finn again. Are you able to squeeze water out of that white stone? he asked, putting one into Cool Cullen's hand. The latter squeezed and squeezed the stone, but in vain. Ah, you're a poor creature, said Finn. You're a giant. Give me the stone here, and when I show you what Finn's little son can do, you may then judge of what, what my daddy himself is. Finn then took the stone, and exchanging it for the curds, he squeezed the latter until the whey, as clear as water, oozed in a little shower from his hand. I'll go in, I'll, I'll now go in, he said, to my cradle, for I scorn to lose my time with anyone who's not able to eat my daddy's bread or squeeze water out of a stone. Be dad. You'd better be off out of here before he comes back, for if he catches you, it's in flummery he'd have you in two minutes. Cool Cullen, seeing what he had seen, was of the same opinion himself. His knees knocked together with the terror of Finn's return, and he accordingly hastened to bid Una farewell and assure her from that day out he never wished to hear, much less see her husband. I admit fairly, I am not a match for him, 
said he, strong as I am, tell him I will avoid him as I would the plague, and I will make myself scarce in this part of the country while I live. Finn, in the meantime, had gone into the cradle, where he lay very quietly, his heart at his mouth, with delight that Paul Colin was about to take his departure, without discovering the tricks that had been played on him. It's well for you, said Una, that you doesn't happen to be here, for it's nothing but hawk meat he's made of you. I know that, said Paul Colin, a devil's thing he'd make of me, but before I go, he let me feel what kind of teeth Finn's lads got so that they can eat griddle bread like this. With all the pleasure in life, says she, only they're far back in his head, so you must put your finger a good way in. Paul Colin was surprised to find such a powerful set of grinders in one so young, but he was still very much more on so finding, so when he took his hands from Finn's mouth, he had left the very finger in which his whole strength depended. Behind him, he gave one loud groan and fell down at once with terror and weakness. This is all Finn wanted, who now knew that his most powerful and bitterest enemy was at his mercy. He started out of the cradle, and in a few minutes the grateful Colin, for that was such a length of time, the terror of him and all his followers lay a corpse before him. Thus did Finn, through the wit and intervention of Una, his wife, succeeded in overcoming his enemies by cunning, which he could have never done by force. And that is the legend of Knockdown.